I want you to know you are in God's presence. Before we started this live stream, before you jumped on, it was probably just your bedroom, it was probably just your kitchen, maybe it was your living room, but now you are in the presence of God. And we are going to have church, we are going to worship Him, we are going to hear from His Word, we are going to have an encounter with Jesus. So I'm glad you came, I'm glad you joined on, and tonight I welcome you to Influence Church and to our live stream. If you haven't had an opportunity to share this stream, why not do that? One time, do it immediately so that your friends, family members can be a part of our worship session and can hear from God's Word. We've started a series of messages on Stay Connected. We've had two installments thus far, last week and the week before. Last week we spoke from There is No Us Without Trust. And we shared some truths about trust. Trust can be heard, it can be seen, it can be remembered. It's based on our track record. And we can trust God with our future because we know that he has proven himself time and time after again that he is trustworthy. The week before that, we spoke on the heart and the fact that God wants to heal hearts and give us a healthy heart because a healthy heart produces much for God. Today, we are going into the third installment of Stay Connected. This is version three. And usually the third part of the trilogy is supposed to be the best, right? Like the Batman trilogy and the and Superman didn't make it to a trilogy, but it's supposed to be the best. I know for sure the trilogy of Jesus Christ was the best. The first day he was crucified, the second day he remained in the tomb, but the third day he rose from the grave. And that's a trilogy I can celebrate. So stay connected. Stay connected. I've realized that over the last couple of months that I found myself in a place where I've really been introspect in my own life and mainly due to COVID-19 and all the changes that, that has happened, all the shifts in what has been our norm for so long and especially with the fact that we've had to close our physical buildings as a church and also as well not being able to progress forward at the pace that we would usually progress in a normal year. This has not been a normal year by any means. And I found myself really reflecting on life. From a young age, I grew accustomed to a busy lifestyle. When I entered university, we had that, that pace that was set for us as a university student. That we'd go to class from 8 in the morning, probably go till straight till 5 in the afternoon. Then from 5 o'clock, we go into labs. Then from labs, you go home and you do assignments. From assignments, you study till maybe 3 in the morning. Then you wake up again and you do that again. And I got so accustomed to this high-paced lifestyle, this busy lifestyle, this active lifestyle. And that moved from university straight on after graduating, starting a job, and then pastoring and doing both these things. And then as well, uh, maintaining a, a, a relationship, <laughs> How many know relationship is work, right? I, I'll turn into my keyboardist and my um, drummer, but they're quiet. They want to say nothing. But relationship is work. And, it, and that is something as well. That's why you don't date when you're studying, right? You can't, you can't do the both, right? And then you start dating after um, graduating from university and then preparing to get married and all these different things, you know. I got so accustomed to that fast-paced lifestyle. And then Corona hit this year. We just launched our church. We went through a three months where we were pushing heavily in construction of our building, where we were up, uh, Nick, you remember, we were up to like three every morning the week before lunch, getting this place ready, painting the wall. If you see some spots on the wall, that's where Nick paint, right? The places are looking real good, that's where Kari paint, right? So, <laughs> so it's been that, uh, that, that high pace experience. And with the stop in that high pace that Corona caused over Trinidad and over the entire world, it had me reflecting on what really is the meaning of life. What is the meaning of life? Because I'd gotten so consumed that I'd come to a point where I always saw life as hitting some major target goals. And I felt at a young age, I ticked off the box on some major goals already. I graduated, I got a job, I got a wife, <laughs> I um, launched a church and started a ministry as a lead pastor. And I ticked all these, these significant boxes. And I felt as though with the slow pace, the change in pace, the change in rhythm, I found myself in a place really wondering what is the meaning of life. 
Is it that because now our pace has slowed down that we need to do more to feel fulfilled? And I felt maybe we needed to do more as a church or we needed, I needed to study more or learn something more or pick up a, something new to be able to develop myself to feel as though I'm feeling fulfilled in life. And as I inspected and inspected my own life, I realized that we've allowed society a lot to shape what we see as the meaning of life. We've allowed society to shape the meaning of life to be education or career or money or major accomplishments or even having, having a kid and having children or different things. We've allowed it to shape our meaning of life. And while all these things are good, when corona hits and all these things are stripped away, what does that really leave us with? And the reality is, all these things will eventually pass away. You see, one thing is for certain. We all have to reach a point where we'll be dead and gone. That's the reality. We don't like to think about it. But one day we'd reach that point. And we can't carry with us the wealth, the riches. We can't carry with us the major accomplishments. We can't carry it with us, with us after death. So the question is, what really is the meaning of life? And that's our title for tonight's sermon. What is the meaning of life? And I know it's a difficult question and it's a big topic, but we're going to dive into it and you're going to find something very extraordinary. That maybe the meaning of life is much simpler than we expect it to be. In the book of Mark chapter 12, verse 28 to 34, we find a group of people that comes to Jesus with the same question. What is the meaning of life? And let's see what happens when they bring this question to Jesus. Mark chapter 12, verse 28 to 34. So grab your Bible, open up to the book of Mark. We've been studying from Mark and we've completed the entire gospel of Mark as a church over the last three weeks. So we're at Mark chapter 12 and verse 28. It says, Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceived that he had answered them well, and asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? This was the question they posed him. And I know what you're thinking. This isn't what is the meaning of life. That's a different question. No. I want you to understand that for these scribes and Pharisees, their entire life revolved around fulfilling the law. That is what they lived for. That was their meaning of life. They had 613 commandments that they had to follow precise to the letter and perfectly fulfill every single day without flaw, without failing to repeat the cycle every single day. So the law for them was the entire meaning of life. This is what they lived for. So when they came to Jesus and said, what is the first commandment? It was if we in this generation were asking to Jesus, what is the meaning of life? What does it all amount to in the end? And Jesus answered him. And he said, and this answer holds true for both the scribes and the Pharisees, those who revolved around the law. And for us today, who revolve around education, we revolve around career, we revolve around, around different parts of, of life that society has taught us is important. This same answer holds true for both scenarios. What is the meaning of life? Jesus answered him. And he said, the first of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. I want to let you know that there is only one God. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And this is the first commandment. And the second commandment is like it. It is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Jesus here is saying something that has echoed through the entire generation of history. That has echoed from one age to the other. It has echoed, but yet we have been deaf to his word. He is saying over and over that life amounts to simply two things. And that is number one, love God. And number two, love people. Stay connected. What is the meaning of life? Love God and love people. It's really simple. So if it's so simple, then why is it that we find it so difficult? If it's so simple, 
then why do we find it so difficult? Let's continue in verse 32. It says, so the scribe said to him, well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth. For there is one God, and there is no other but him. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength. And to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. For them, burnt offerings and sacrifices was all that was the most important in fulfilling their role and duty and finding purpose in life. For us, it may be different in our generation. It might be something completely different for you that you thought was what was finding or giving you fulfillment. And now that corona has stripped that away, now that you no longer have to plan for that significant event, now that you no longer have to put things in place and chase after a certain goal because you simply cannot, you're asking yourself the same question. What is the meaning of life? Now when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. You are not far from the kingdom of God. To be able to enter the kingdom of God, to be a part of what God has called us to do on this earth, to be a part of why God has created us, to find fulfillment and purpose, it requires us to do two things. Love God and love people. That is the meaning of life. And I realized that the issue wasn't that COVID-19 challenged my routines. Because initially that's what I thought it was. I thought it was that COVID challenged my routine of going to church and it, it challenged my routine of going to work and it challenged my routine of progressing forward. But it wasn't that it challenged my routine, but it was that it challenged my relationships. How many of you feel challenged right now in your relationships? The reality is, for me, I, I have not hugged my mom in months. Not because I don't love her, but because I'm trying not to be irresponsible and be responsible for transferring the virus in any way, even though I'm not a carrier of the virus. And it's challenged our relationships. It's challenged for many of us how we do church, how we speak to God, how we find ourselves connected to God. Just today, I had someone that was begging me, can I come to church, please? Can I come to church, please? And I had to say, no, unfortunately, it's going against the current laws that are placed over our land. It's challenged us. For some of us, we may feel as though life has not changed that much. But for some of us, it has really challenged our relationships in how we connect. Because love demands a connection. Love demands a connection. And the connection that it demands is not that you love God, but that God loves you. You see, God in this relationship between you and him, God is the initiator. Nick, I have a major issue, right? With women proposing to men, right? I don't think, Carrie, a woman should ever propose to a man. And I know you might say, well, we're living in modern times and this is a different generation. I would go even one step further and I would say, I don't think a woman should ever initiate a conversation with a man. I think that's his responsibility. I think that's the man's responsibility to go up to that woman and say, hey, how you doing? I think it's the man's responsibility to initiate that relationship. And God sets that example when it comes to love, because love requires a connection. And God initiated the relationship between you and him by loving you first. He proposed to you by sending Jesus Christ to this earth to die for you. He initiated. He initiated. And that's why the Bible calls Jesus the bridegroom, because he's coming for some and he's coming for those that are prepared to enter into a marriage covenant with him. And that's the thing about it. Jesus showed us the example of love. The Bible tells us there's no greater love that a man would lay down his life for a friend. Jesus died for you. Jesus died so that you can be connected to God day and night, every moment. And not one moment should pass by where you are separated from God. And I mentioned that there is no greater love than a man would lay down his life. And ladies, I wonder, 
How many of you can say your husband would willingly die for you? <laughs> would willingly lay down his life for you? And this might be very extreme, right? But Kari, if you want to know if that, if that boyfriend that you're dating is really husband material, you could probably hire Stefan, right? To come and pretend to be a criminal and pull a gun, a fake gun, of course, a water gun, and see if that boy would take a bullet for you. Because the reality is, this is what we have been called to do as husbands. Paul says to the church, husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. That is a sacrificial type of love. That is a dying, laying down your life in love. There is no greater love than a man would lay down his life for the one that he loves. And this is what Jesus did for you because love requires a connection. And God is the initiator between you and I. God is the initiator when it comes to love. God wants to know that we are connected to him through love. Sacrificial love. What is the meaning of life? Love God and love people. You see, the only time in the Bible that God ever said that something was not good was when he saw Adam alone in the garden. And he said, it's not good for man to be alone. Love God and love people. He said, loneliness isn't good. And I think that a lot of us have found ourselves in that place where we are suffering with loneliness. Now that we've come to this place where we have to social distance, where we can't move about, that we can't have social gatherings, that we can't meet with the people we'd usually meet with, that we can't interact with even our own family members, we're finding ourselves in that place of loneliness. And God wants to speak to that place of loneliness because God said it is not good to be alone. It's not good to be alone because life sums up to the meaning of loving God and loving people both in one. And while we can love God alone, we can't love people alone. A connection requires proximity. A connection requires relationship. It requires us to communicate. He said man should not be alone. And loneliness is what the enemy uses to bring us to a place where he can easily trap us in shame, in guilt, and in depression. Loneliness brings us to that place where we even contemplate what is really life. What is my life really amounting to when we contemplate even to the extent of suicide? Loneliness. This is why God said it is not good for man to be alone. Love God and love God people. And I know it's challenging in the season to be able to love people, but we got to find ways and we got to find means. We got to use those Skype calls and those WhatsApp calls and those Zoom meetings to connect with people. We got to use the technology. And it really makes me wonder if what we face right now happened 30 or 40 years ago, how would we survive not being able to connect with people? Because luckily, God has made it in such a way that in the generation that coronavirus hits the earth is the one generation in all of history that is so technologically advanced and prepared to be able to communicate in mass proportions when a mass disaster tries to separate us. Don't let the enemy separate you into a place of loneliness and isolation that will lead you to depression. God has given us the tools and he's equipped us to be able to connect because we got to love God and we got to love people. Some of us have even become depressed because we can't go to church. Because we've grown up and we've developed into that lifestyle where the only way I could really connect with God is by going and being in the church building. By being in that place where I am in that atmosphere and I feel the music and I feel the worship and I feel the presence of God. And now with all that church setting, we find ourselves disconnected from God. But God only requires us to do two things in this season. He requires us to talk to him and to hear from him. This is how we stay connected. He requires us to pray. That is us talking to him and he requires us to read his Bible. That is him speaking to us. And the challenge is, that it's easy for us to pray. It's easy to pray. 
It's easy to pour your problems out. It's easy to just talk to God and say, this is what I face. This is my issue. This is the problems. This is the people that are challenging me. This is this, this is that. This is. It's easy to pray because praying is oftentimes shifted from being a communication with God and just a pouring out of my problems. And I can say to God whatever I want. And while that is good to let God know where you're at emotionally, to let God know where you're struggling, the challenges that while many of us find it easy to pray, we find it very hard to read God's word. Very hard to read God's word. And I find that so strange that it's easy to pray, but it's hard to read God's word. It's easy to talk to God, but it's hard to hear from God. And maybe, just maybe, the enemy doesn't want you hearing what God has to say. Maybe, just maybe, the enemy knows from the time you hear what God has to say in this season, he won't be able to hold you hostage to all his tricks and all his deceptions. Just maybe the truths that you need to survive on through the season of COVID-19 to remain connected to God relies and lays in the word of God. Just maybe it's his word that you need to hear in this season. And that's the strange thing. Because I know so many people that will say, I pray every day. But ask them, any scriptural reference and they won't be able to answer why because the enemy is trying his best to keep us from reading god's word my admonition to all of us in this season is that as believers as christians as followers of jesus we make it our daily mission to read God's word. This is why as a church, I'm encouraging us to read book by book in the Bible because we have to challenge ourselves to hear from God. I know sometimes you may open the Bible and you might fall asleep when you try to read it. Sometimes you might open the Bible and you might find the words aren't making sense. Sometimes you might read one chapter 10 times. But that's okay. Just let the words of God be resident in your life. Read it. Use the audio Bible. Let it sink into your spirit because you have to connect with God. And this is one of the essential parts of hearing from God's word. And I'm stressing on it a lot because even though I preach it, even though I'd say it, even though you grow up here and read your Bible, pray every day and you'll grow, grow, grow. Even though it has been sunk into your mental capacity for all these years. If you're being honest with yourself, you find it challenging. If you're being honest, you probably didn't even read your Bible today. And I'm not looking to condemn. I'm not looking to judge. I'm not looking to cast stones. I'm looking to encourage you and tell you. That this is what is the secret to keeping yourself connected to God in this season. So love God and love people. Love demands a connection. What is the meaning of life? Let me answer that question in another way. By using a statement. What is the meaning of life? Here's the statement. Life without Jesus has no meaning. Life without Jesus has no meaning. Life without Jesus is hopeless. Life without Jesus is monotonous. Life without Jesus is depressing. Life without Jesus is simply pointless. The antidote and the solution to the fulfillment of life lies in a relationship with God. And that relationship with God comes through knowing his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus died on the cross so that there would be an open connection between earth and heaven for you to communicate with God. And the reality will always remain that life without Jesus has no meaning. It has no meaning. If you even look at the disciples of Jesus, up until when they met Jesus, their life was void without meaning. For Peter, he spent all his life being a fisherman. And he wasn't that good at it because every time we read about Peter fishing, we read about him coming back without a catch, with empty nets. He spent all his life being a fisherman until the day that he met Jesus, who made him into a fisher of men and gave him 
purpose. If we look at James and John, they were known to be the sons of thunder. That doesn't mean they were nice people. That doesn't mean they were the, the, the boys in the community that helped everyone out. The sons of thunder, they had a bad reputation. They caused chaos where they went until the day that they met Jesus and they became a voice of thunder to all the nations proclaiming that there is one that gives fulfillment and life. If you look at Matthew, he was a tax collector who stole from the poor until the day that he met Jesus. And he became a man that gave the gospel to the poor and preached to those brokenhearted and lowly in spirit. If we look at Paul, he was a murderer until he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And he began to share the gospel of eternal life. In one stage, he took life. But with Jesus on his side, with Jesus in his life, he gave life. Because life without Jesus has no meaning. And tonight, if you don't know Jesus, if you don't have a genuine connection with him, this is why your life feels like there is no meaning. This is why life feels as though it is not making sense living. This is why life feels as if it's upside down and it does not even add value at all. This is why life feels like a cycle of repetition, why it feels like I'm just waking up, going through the motions and starting all over again. Life only finds meaning when you find a relationship with Jesus and Jesus is the initiator. Jesus stepped down from heaven into earth to connect with you, to grab you by your hands, to say I'm a friend that will stick closer than a brother. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to care for you. I'm going to stick by you. I know times are tough. I know depression is creeping in. I know isolation is trying to send you insane, but Jesus is here to give life meaning. Life without Jesus has no meaning. What is the meaning of life? Love God. Love people. Love requires a connection. That's why the cross symbolizes two connections in its two directions. The cross is vertical, representing a connection between us and God. But the cross is also horizontal representing a connection between us and people. Stay connected. The meaning of life is loving God and loving people. Tonight, I want to ask you this question. Do you find life to be meaningless? Is it challenging? And maybe you found yourself in that place just like me, where you were thinking that Maybe it's because my routine has changed. Maybe it's because I can't hit those target goals that I had planned out for this year. But as you search your life closely, you would realize that the meaning of life really comes down to having a relationship with God and keeping your relationship with your loved one. And that is where you are finding the difficulty in this season. And if you've never known God, and you've never accepted Jesus into your life, then tonight, it's an awesome time to find meaning in life by finding a relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus came from heaven to earth to die for you so that you can have relationship with God. He laid his life down because there is no greater love than a man would die for you. Jesus died for you. And tonight, He's knocking on your door. He's knocking on your heart of loneliness. He's knocking and saying, let me in so that I can bring to meaning all that life holds in it. And tonight, if you're hearing this message and you're saying, yes, I want to receive this Jesus. I want to find this fulfillment in life. Then tonight, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And as you pray this prayer and you say it from your heart tonight, you're going to invite Jesus into your life to be Lord and Savior and so that you can have a true relationship with God. So tonight, if you're saying, yes, I want this connection. I want this relationship with God. I want to ask you in this moment to close your eyes 
and to take your right hand and place it over your heart as a form of surrender. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And this prayer, it's very simple. All it states is that, God, I need you. God, I believe in you. God, I've messed up and I need your forgiveness as well. And from this day forward, I want to serve you and be connected to you. So as I pray, follow me tonight. Repeat after me from your heart and God is going to step in to your life. Let us pray tonight. Heavenly Father, tonight I desire a connection with you. Tonight, God, I know that you love me. Tonight I realize that you've laid your life down for me. And there is no greater love than that. You showed me love because you desired relationship with me. You initiated, God, a relationship with me. And God, I've realized that I've made mistakes. That I am a sinner. And I need you to forgive me of my sins. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that He died for me. I believe that three days later He rose from the grave so that I can have everlasting life. And tonight I confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of my life. From this day forward, I will live for Jesus. So God, let me be connected to you now. And Lord, as I'm connected to you, Help me, God, to stay connected with the people that you've placed in my life. To love you and to love your people. So I thank you now, Almighty God, for hearing my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. If you've prayed that prayer, you are now connected to God. You are connected to Jesus Christ. You are now going to find the meaning to life. What is the meaning of life? Love God. Love people. Stay.